Martyrdom, the TV show. Welcome to episode 11 of Loggerdome, the TV show. Yeah, on atheism slash religion slash accurate description of reality. Yeah, that's really what it's about. What's the truth of our existence? And what's the implications of that existence would be more, it's a bigger, better subject. But let's focus on where most of the people are. And most of the people, unfortunately, you, <laughs> probably, um, are in some place where you believe some thing, some force, some entity, some mechanism created life or created the game, created the, the rules of the game, the want, the desire, and the idea that we're supposed to moderate the want and the desire to praise he who created us, um, as some sort of testament to our devotion and our obedience and all of that mush. So, if you're one of the standard religions, um, you got there mostly because you were born into it. <laughs> so, it's like a, a smell you have that you acquired in your youth and you've chosen to keep that smell. You've said, ah, it's a good enough smell, I'll keep it. And, um, because something hasn't motivated you to say there's any need to change, I suppose. It's socially acceptable. It makes it possible for you to go back home and not be offensive because you don't smell different. Um, so it has lots of superficial, psychiatric kind of benefits. And so then you stay there. But it's there isn't the right place to be. So I suppose the first bit of truth that needs to be understood or agreed upon is the truth that the truth matters and that you really do need to get it right to live right yeah so you have to actually know the world you're living in the game you're playing whether it's monopoly or checkers or chess before you can play it coherently and if you believe something that isn't true a fundamental thing like god created me um and it's not true <laughs> then you're probably not playing the game right by the right rules um, so, yeah, my job, my assignment, um, is to attempt to make an argument, to, to say words that will somehow give you a perspective where you'll say, gee, uh, I can step past this. I, it's time to take a shower, reboot, and decide what I want to be as a human being. Do I want to be something real <laughs> that's living in the real world, or do I want to be some kind of dupe? To a fable, some sort of slave to an archaic bit of nonsense, you know, written on rocks um, by people who didn't know what a didn't know what lightning was, didn't know what thunder was, didn't know what a bacterium was, didn't know anything about the world because their god didn't tell them anything. They ate from the tree of knowledge, <laughs> but they didn't gain any. Uh, they didn't have any. Uh, they didn't uh, acquire degrees in any kind of scientific discipline whatsoever. Um, so they didn't get very knowledgeable. I guess you got to eat more than one apple. Um, but anyway, and we could just talk about these, these fables and just the... I mean, part of me just says, how can you defend this? How can you defend a god who punishes all women forever for Eve's sin? I mean, to give women a period and pain in childbirth as a direct punishment for her behavior. You, you know, you, know, you think that's okay? You, you know, beat the shit out of criminals' children? We should, we should do that? We should go find a criminal and then beat the crap out of its kids? <laughs> Does that make sense to you? That's a god you wish to be obedient to? Oh, come on. I mean, right there, the game's over, isn't it? I mean, do I have to go through the, the, the crazy Muslim nonsense? Um, <laughs> the child molestation, essentially? Um, the enslavement of the women? Um, let's just pretend. Let's just pretend they don't have uh, 100 billion neurons. Let's just pretend they only have 50 billion or 20 or 15. And we'll pretend they're not programmed like everybody else to smell. <laughs> okay, smell like a slave, smell like a dupe, a fool. 
Um, they're not programmed into it. They're, they're not maturated into it, just like a slave was. Um, because they didn't know any better, because they didn't let him know any better. They kept the slaves ignorant for a reason, to keep them obedient to the bullshit, the stupid rules. Break a rule, we'll beat up your wife. You know, same kind of God rules, right? We can't stop them from doing something, so we'll punish all of them if any of them get out of line. So we'll make it so they force each other to stay slaves. Because we'll make it clear that you're all going to be harmed if any of you step out of line. Just like God, control the slaves. Um, it's time to rebel. It's time to say no. No, I won't be a slave to nonsense. And I know it's difficult. It's like a superstition. Okay, that's what religion is. It preys on the same parts of the brain that just tend to want to do that intuitive thing. We're paranoid. I could almost compare it to feral cats, okay? I feed some feral cats and they're so paranoid. You know, they've been hurt once and they just can't get past it. You know, and they're just never going to be able to, they, they just can't trust. And it's not until you flood them, you know, until you free them of their slavery entirely, you know, like just force them to accept your embrace, that they understand you wish them no harm, that the harm is over, that it's not going to happen again. It's all or nothing in a sense. And you're stuck in this position where you're afraid. You're afraid of, of, of giving up something or losing something um, precious. But yes, and I'm saying that this desire to be have an afterlife and to do all this stuff is very nice and not going to hell. But can you see how your mind is just using the same mechanisms that held people in slavery? That you're just afraid. It's the fear itself. There's no logic to it. There's no rationality. It's stepping on a crack, break your mother's back. You know, there's kids that get that in their head and they think it's true. And they're paranoid. And that's all you are, is paranoid. That you're going to violate and that you're going to be punished for your violation. But there is nothing to violate. If you really look at it, if you really am honest about it, you can free yourself of it. You can liberate yourself from this paranoia that uh, you're, you're in a, uh, a vulnerable position um, and that you're likely to be giving up or to be harmed uh, because you reject the fable and say, no, I'm going to be a real brain. <laughs> okay, I'm going to I'm going to free my brain and let it be a brain instead of letting it be a possession of a thousand year old story, a fable, a little bit of nonsense written down by ignorant people to explain their reality. In a sense, they were sort of innocent in this crime because they were ignorant. They didn't know what was going on and all they could do was say, we're ants in a bigger universe because that's all they had is information all they had was their condition and they had no understanding of this billions of years and evolution and DNA molecules and chemistry and you know microbiology and elemental science and physics they didn't have any of that knowledge and so all they had was the reality of their existence and they knew that every cake that ever existed in their life they had to bake it <laughs> they know the cakes didn't come from nowhere, so they knew that they, hey, we must have been baked, because there's no other explanation. But they didn't even think, you know, because they were ignorant, far enough to realize that, well, wait a minute, who, who made the cake baker? But, you know, the original religions did have a, a whole soap opera of gods. You know, the father and the son wasn't a, a silly concept in the sense that the gods had a whole lineage of their own. <laughs> so there was apparently a god who made the gods. Um, but see, it doesn't really answer the question of creation to say that some intelligence always existed and it sat around forever doing absolutely nothing and then one day decided, I'll make human beings and then I'll kill them all because you know they ate an apple and then I'll kill them all because they did some other stupid thing. Uh, I mean, it's just not a very good plan. And you'd say if something, if a god had forever to think about it, you'd think he would have had a better plan. I mean, it's obvious he wasn't infallible, he wasn't all these other things, because he wouldn't have had to kill the, 
you wouldn't have had to invent Noah, right? We wouldn't have to have that whole saga and story if he knew what he was doing, right? Right. So let's give up on this idea that, you know, well, that's the contradictions of the fable. The fable tells you one thing in one place, it tells you another thing in another place. Ah, nice interruption. I shall be back. Ah, it wasn't a nice interruption after all. <sighs> crank callers. Anyway, see, that's what you get. Yeah, they do pay a price for being anti-anything. Because they'll come and get you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the evildoers. Um, so anyway, where was I? Yeah, so, so, you know, they're full of contradictions. Full of one minute, just stone this homosexual the next minute you're supposed to decide, well, ah, uh, if I have no sin. Well, what does that even mean? But if I have no sin? Does that mean I can throw rocks? <laughs> you know? I mean, these cliches aren't something to live by. This kind of morality isn't going to get you anywhere. Thou shalt not kill. Christians have killed more people in the history of mankind than just about anyone except the Muslims. I mean, the whole popularity of Christianity. Christianity wouldn't even exist as a religion if it didn't slaughter, okay, just murder, outright murder, um, thousands of civilizations. The North American Indians are the most, perhaps the most recent example of the overt slaughter, the genocide. But it happened all through Europe, it happened all through Africa. Um, just all kinds of civilizations annihilated. <laughs> and why? Because they didn't believe in their God. Where is that in the Ten Commandments? Go kill everybody who doesn't believe. Oh, that's right, we said thou shalt not kill. No, you can kill non-believers, that's okay, because they don't count, they're not human beings. Come on, where's the logic in any of this? Um, so, um, but so anyway, the, the point is you're going to have to understand your own psychology and understand that you're being controlled because this is something mommy did to you, mommy and daddy. This is something culture did to you. It made you feel as if this is this will give you support, and this will be there for you, and will be there for you. But isn't this superficial being there for you? It's like being loved because you're beautiful, right? I mean, it's sort of a dangerous thing. It's really nice to be attractive and nice and all that kind of stuff, but it's also dangerous in that people will live, love you for a superficial reason. And when the superficial reason is gone, there'll be no love, there'll be no anything, you know, because you won't be serving their purpose anymore. You won't be useful to their cause. Um, and yes, it's difficult to not belong and not to be one of the crowd and all that stuff because when you have to stand alone, you're easier to knock down, right? And there is so many, there's so many things out to get you, so to speak. But acting out of fear, is that what you want to do in your life? You want to act out of fear? Or do you want to act out of a, a dignity and uh, a desire to do the right thing in, in every way? And to be, to be, to be fair, to what has been paid for this thing. So that's another. You know, you can use a million of these little examples of things. But here we have this idea of Jesus Christ suffering on the cross. And at worst, it's a few days of this brutality, this torture. And you could just think of one kid with, you know, cancer, getting bone marrow. You know, the third bone marrow transplant, um, going through all the chemo, all the horror. You say, well, why didn't, if God wants to prove how, how strong and how devoted and how, like, he really was going to give it, give Jesus hell, <laughs> you know, as a human, uh, just to show him how much he was willing to sacrifice for us, why didn't he give Jesus cancer? Why, why didn't he let Jesus rot and die in front of uh, the human race? Watch the God go through the brutality that humans go through almost inevitably. Most of us are not going to die pleasantly. We're going to have to go through some horrible process of attrition where our body will be our enemy <clears throat> and be attacking you every day. Every day you'll be hanging on that cross and it can go on for months and for some people it goes on for years. So where's your monument to that suffering? You know, you'll, you'll wear your you're suffering Jesus around your necks. <laughs> You'll put him on your walls as a testament to courage and, and strength. But it happens every day. Things have to be courageous and have to be strong. 
to earn their survival and then they don't even earn it they don't get any survival all they get is dead and in a very expensive way um, you see love in that you see God in that you see beauty in that you see something to be devoted to in that or can you rationally understand that now this is just the biology it's a it's a game where a molecules getting replicated and uh, the, uh, the expectation that it would be beautiful would be nonsensical and that's why it's not beautiful it's because it's not designed by something intelligent it's a natural force of, of attrition it's, it's designed to perpetuate nothing but existence itself it makes things that survive for a period of time to lay an egg and then die that game isn't going to be an attractive game there's nothing in that goal <laughs> that would have anything graceful in the idea of getting there. There's just nothing to expect from that. Um, wouldn't you expect a lot more from a god than for your greatest hero to have to sacrifice much less than the common child slaughtered by cancer? think you can understand that. So anyway, there's just so much of this with the Bible. The, the inverted hero, the, the stuff you are admiring that is nothing to admire, um, and the fact that you, how much of the real world it makes you blind to, and you can't see um, the realness of it, the grit of it, the horror of it because you've negated it with the, <clears throat> the fable, the fairy tale. And maybe that makes life easier. It, um, I can't say, because I, I could never find any real confidence. <laughs> the story always seemed suspect. And the more I challenged the story, I mean, I did ask God to talk to me. I mean, I gave him a shot more than once as a child. I said, okay, I'll play along. You know, all right, you want to own me. You want to tell me these are the rules to play by, even though some of them don't make any sense at all. But okay, let's just say this is the game I'm supposed to play. I'm supposed to hate my penis. Sorry, I said penis, but I'm supposed to hate it. It's some sort of enemy. Okay, got it. Uh, all right, you tell me why, and I'll play along. <laughs> I mean, you gave me the thing, but I'm not supposed to play with it. Okay, you tell me why. All right, I'll, and, and then I'll understand. But I really can't understand until you explain it, because it just doesn't make any sense to me. You give me something, and then you say, don't use it. Huh. Oh, you give me desire, but I'm not supposed to have it. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but anyway, so I'm saying, let's, all right, let's play along. Um, go ahead. Enlighten me. I'm saying, I'm just, let's pretend I'm a North American Indian. Okay, who doesn't know anything, who hasn't been brainwashed or propagandized by the book being passed on. The book seems vital. So I, I'm completely ignorant of your religion. I'm now saying, go ahead, fill me with your love. Fill me with something, do something, say something to me. To say, okay, I have reason, some sort of, some sort of sense I can make of this. Um, give me that. And I think it didn't happen. So obviously it does happen for some other people though. Okay, I can't deny it, but I don't know whether that again is just being badgered into it. <laughs> I mean, I think when the missionaries convert the people, they kind of badger them into the slavery, don't they? If we'll feed you, if you praise God, we'll take care of you, we'll give you some blankets, we'll, you know, they bribe people into it. And once they have them seduced by the bribery, uh, you know, then they start scaring them, you know, with the, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, we all believe it, all us people who have been giving you blankets believe it, so you better believe it. And, yeah, you take advantage of their inability to form a counter theory of reality, and uh, so they fall for it. But that's all they're doing, they're falling for it. <laughs> you know, they're being duped into, um, you know, a lie, uh, a bunch of nonsense, contrived nonsense, and that's what it is over time, right? So that's another context here. Is again, you could say, all right, 
this is what ignorant people did when we didn't have any science and we didn't have any knowledge. They were essentially the first scientists. They were the people smart enough to say, well, let's figure out why we're here. But they didn't have any evidence to draw a reasonable deduction. So they came up with a bunch of nonsense. And then they tried to conform it into a story. And then over time, they took out the parts they liked and took out the parts they didn't like. They obviously left a lot of silly parts in for reasons unknown. <laughs> but they left them in there anyway. Um... You know, naked Noahs and stuff. I mean, stuff, you know, if I was editing the Bible, I'd say, well, let's get that part out of there, because that just makes this all sound silly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many of those elements. But anyway, you know, find a dead bird on the road. Give it to a poor man. Why? So I can make him sick? <laughs> yeah, that makes me a good person. I just made a poor guy sick. Wow, like the poor guy wasn't bad off enough. I gave him a poisonous dead bird. I mean, it's not good enough for me to eat, but it's good enough for him to eat. That's another one of those God ethics. Wow, that's really cool. Not. No, so anyway. I mean, it's Old Testament, yeah. So Old Testament's nonsense. Okay, I get it, I get it. <laughs> I don't know why they kept it in the book, though, right? That's another thing, right? If you're going to have a Christian religion about Jesus, why do you put all that Old Testament crap in there? Because it seems to me that just ruins the whole story. But anyway, that's just me. If I was doing religion, <laughs> yeah, if I was doing religion, it wouldn't be religion anymore because the whole thing right from the start is nonsensical. You know, where's Cain's wife, right? It's, where'd she come from? Story already doesn't make any sense. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Cain is married to... What? Chimpanzee? <laughs> I mean, what, 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 I don't know. Doesn't make any sense, right? Right. All right. Um, so, psychology. Again, we have to get back to the psychology because you're being you're being controlled. Again, you're just you're just saying I must keep my religion. I must, I must because my family because it, it's I can't step on the crack. I can't step on the crack. I'll break my mother's back, and so you figure you'll break your little mother's heart or you'll. You'll ruin your life or something horrible will happen to you if you do this horrible, awful thing of saying, Okay, okay, I know it's nonsense. I mean, I know you already know it's nonsense. I know you know that. And you're just trying to make it work. And you think it's maybe benign because, Oh, it can't hurt if I think killing people is bad. And it can't hurt if I don't cheat on my wife. And it can't hurt if I do these little things. And if society all runs by this and they all obey these rules, oh, it's all benign. It can't be too big a problem. But we know it's a big problem because people are hypocrites. <laughs> okay, they don't. They, they, they see the door crack open where, hey, if you sin, you can just say you're sorry and it'll be okay. No harm, no foul. You just say it. And, and the God is stupid enough, right? You made this whole God thing and you think he's dumb enough to believe your lies, right? You go into the confessional and just say, oh, I'm sorry. You're not really sorry. <laughs> You're not really repentant. You will do it again. Um, you think your God's dumb enough to believe your, your testimony because the priest fell for it and said, oh, it's all okay. Say five of these Hail Mary things and everything will be just fine. That's your penance. Yes. That's like a nail in your eye. <laughs> you know, having to say some sort of mantra, uh, uh, you know, talking about Jesus being the son of blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, no. A real God, like real Santa Claus. You think real Santa Claus would be fooled by, by little kids who steal money from mommy's purse and then make up some lie that it fell out of her purse or something? I found it on the couch. I found it in a... Yeah, so, you know, you think Santa Claus is fooled? No, Santa Claus wouldn't be fooled. He'd have super radar. He'd know the truth. So why even play a game that you can't... You can't possibly satisfy this God's standards. So you're going to lose in the end because you know you don't really repent. You just say you're sorry. <laughs> you know that's what you're doing. Um, so why? Come on. Why the pretense? You're going to hell. Anyway. Um...
But I guess the argument I would make is that the real danger of religion is just having this wrong idea. And you can see what it's doing in the world. You can see that religion's not doing anything good for people. It's made them into bigots, okay? It's, 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 and then it just creates this stupid conflict that we don't need. We need something exactly the opposite. We need some mechanism, some way not to offend each other catastrophically. And uh, religion doesn't provide that medicine at all. And even if we were to you know, convert all the other religions to your religion, you'd still be stuck with the atheists, so you'd still have conflict anyway between science and fabulology. Um, so you're not going to solve any of those problems with religion. And uh, again, there's all, I mean, I, you know, I should go into all the, the real negatives of religion, which is the human ingrandization, the human ego, um, the idea that animals exist for our abuse and use, as if they aren't our relatives in practical fact, uh, that you don't enslave them to your desire, um, that if you're a responsible, smart person, um, it doesn't mean you eat the passengers on the bus, right? If you're the bus driver, it doesn't mean that you say, hey, I'm just going to eat the passengers. <laughs> yeah, I'm the smartest guy in the bus. I'll just use them and abuse them. That's what the smart thing does. It uses and abuses. That doesn't sound right, right? No, but it isn't right. And that's one of the first things that goes when you really become a citizen of the universe instead of a citizen of your religion. Um, you have to realize that uh, the game is really just a bunch of these organisms that have been created on this planet and they have this capacity to be harmed. They have a sensitive brain that creates sensations and some of those sensations are just awful and that that's our enemy awful sensations that's that's the devil that's the the thing we gotta fight against is the harm that happens to sentient feeling things and that becomes a better much better mission the world's gonna be a much better place if it says thou shalt not cause harm to sensitive creatures as the first commandment unnecessary harm harm that can be mitigated easily by minor sacrifices of traditional behavior um, so yeah that's a better religion trust me um, it's better for the world if you are living in the real world and not a fantasy of, of silly don't step on a crack break your mother's back uh, superstition um, so it's not a benign thing this religion it degrades your intelligence which degrades your functionality in the world you're not really going to be a very good player if you're playing the wrong game I mean I could that's a cliche now for me but I mean I could say it over and over again right maybe I should just do that for an hour you're not going to be a very good player if you're playing the wrong game and religion is a wrong description of reality it's not an accurate description of reality. There is no Jehovah, there's no Holy Ghost, there's no Jesus sitting at his side, and if they're, <laughs> you know, and even that description, is this is all they do all day? They just sit on their throne, <laughs> the Holy Ghost and Jesus and God, and they're just sitting there on each other's lap, you know, watching us go by and saying, hey, I praise you, hey, I praise you. Holy, holy, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> you know, maybe we all sing a song to them. We love Jesus, yes we do, because we're too silly to do anything else. What the fuck? Sorry, use the fuck word. Can't swear in heaven, I'm sure. <laughs> you have to say duty and oh farty puss and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, so that you really... This is what you, this is your ambition for your identity through eternity, is to just keep going around in the circle, going, hey God, I praise you, you're really cool, now get back in the praise God line. And you'll just do that all day long, forever and ever and ever, and you think you won. <laughs> That's winning, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, sorry, that sounds like hell to me. But anyway, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry to be mocking, but it is something to mock. I mean, you, you've got to get past this. This is so immature, so intellectually vacant. There is no evidence of a god. No material evidence at all. None. Zero. Every physical phenomenon is, if it hasn't been thoroughly explained, it's on the brink of thorough explanation. Um, maybe by me. Uh, it's, yes, it, the questions have been answered. All the big ones, all the important ones, all the phenomenon. We've got the whole genome, you know, in computers. The, the history of evolution is almost on, in, a, in a paperback that you could read. Um, it's game over for this kind of crap in terms of what's a logical, reasonable belief. It's just not reasonable for you to believe uh, that your God created this in any way that, as if the Bible describes it at all accurately, like he pulled it out of the dirt and breathed life into it. It just didn't happen that way. You don't exist by that process. Um, and then the evidence that exists is all this testimony from human beings. I mean, you must, I mean, come on, you don't know that human beings are compulsive liars? You haven't figured that out yet? Our entire culture, people watch t commercials like their TV shows, right? Everybody pays, they almost pay money to go to the Super Bowl commercial show. They'll watch commercials on shows showing you commercials. Why would you trust a human being? Why would you trust the testimony of people? Now you can't. You can't even trust people now. Imagine people when there were no fingerprints and there was no you know, nothing. You couldn't. You couldn't convict them with genetic code or something. Can you imagine what horrible monsters people could have been, or would have been in such a time? The only people you could trust are your brother and your sister. That's why everybody was a tribe and a family. But you couldn't trust anybody else because you knew they were selfish, desirous, manipulative monsters. Human beings are not truth tellers unless you, you know, unless you have something pointed at their nuts. You know, something pointy and unpleasant. Um, dangerous. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So come on. Just, just, what, what do you, why? Why are you believing the testimony of thousands of year old ignoramuses and that's what they were they were not smart people in terms of they didn't have a very good education they didn't know much more i mean a, a common seven-year-old six-year-old has more knowledge of the world more understanding of the globe we live on in the solar system we live in than these people you're taking it verbatim you're 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 measuring every word written in their book of Babel as if it's the truth, their testimony of the witnessing of the walking on the water and the rising of the dead and the blah, 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 blah. And again, I, I can just go back to all these stories. And I can just point out the logical contradictions. Do you really believe that the disciples have not been given the power to heal the sick? They have miraculously healed lepers with their own power given to them by Jesus, they have done it in the world, that they would somehow lack confidence that Jesus is God. And here you're expected to have faith. They're not expected to have faith. Shouldn't, shouldn't the disciples be an, a, a testament to the thing they're arguing you should have? I, I mean, isn't there a duplicity in this whole thing? Jesus didn't have to have faith. The disciples didn't have to have faith. Yet the people are expected to have it. They're not given the evidence. They don't get to watch Jesus raise the dead. You've witnessed a guy make a dead person alive. And then you're going to tell me that it honestly makes sense to you that the disciples would turn on him, would deny knowing him, would, would have a lack of confidence that he was God and that their destiny is heaven. They would have a lack of confidence. So I'm just saying, we know these things didn't happen, because if they did happen, there's no way they would lack confidence. It's not, it's, it's a magic trick that would even impress people today, <laughs> let alone impressing them back then. 
There's just no way if it happened, it happened the way they say it happened. So your testimony is so flawed. The book isn't edited by God because it has things in it that are just too obvious a contradiction, too obviously nonsensical. And again, why would you even want, why, if I was a god, <laughs> the first thing I would edit out is, oh shit, that whole part where I tor tortured children for the crimes of the parents, that makes me sound like an idiot. I, I, I don't want to, uh, no, nobody with a freaking rational brain tortures children to punish parents. That's insane. Yeah, come on. Alright, so, back to psychology, maybe and superstition because that's all that's holding you to this that's all that's all the only thing that binds people to religion is fear all right you're bound to the fable because you're just afraid to let it go you're afraid that it really is true and i've, I've given away my golden egg i've lost my ticket my e-ticket to disney world i lost it in a raffle um, it's like it's having something in your house, like maybe you have something in your house that you've kept for 30 years, and it's been absolutely useless, but you know it might be valuable someday. Someday it just, it might save my life. It might be the stairway to heaven. And that's what you're thinking this religion is. It's your stairway to an eternal bliss and wonder and happiness and blah, blah, blah. And it's not, it's not real. It's moldy, it's crappy, it's if you really try to unravel this ladder, it will go nowhere. It just says it on the box, okay? You know, don't you have a box in your house where it says something on the box, and then when you really open the box, you say, oh, <laughs> shit, it's a rubber glove. Why is that in there? I mean, it's just, no, it's nothing. It's, it's a piece of crap you put somewhere because you didn't want to get around to throwing it away. But it's not what the box says, right? You think you have something. But you sold that, and you have something else in the box, and you don't even realize it. But that's just that's all this is. This 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 thing you think you have. This this I have a grip on heaven. You have nothing. You have you're holding nothing. There's no rope. There's no bridge. There's no anything. There's no way to get there with a stupid fable. If you want heaven, you have to make it here on earth. You have to start cleaning this crap hole up. Start building some sort of real world that's decent enough for children to live in. Some kind of real wonderland. You either make it as a fact or it will not exist. Because it doesn't exist out there somewhere. You're not floating there. You're not getting there some other way. And okay, that just sounds like forget about it. I ain't bothering with that because you know there's, you can't get human beings to do any of that kind of stuff, especially religious kook human beings. So I might as well just stay a religious kook human beings because they bake me cakes on Sunday. Maybe that's all it is to you. Maybe you're so pathetic, <laughs> you know, that you just don't care about optimizing yourself, making yourself into something more than a toady, than a, a Borgite. To a silly mission of distraction and spinning in circles because that's all you're doing you're just a bunch of kids playing the spinning in circle game oh, i'm wonderful i'm wonderful god's wonderful oh, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. And you're just you know there's nothing productive you might as well be a teletubby just going porridge 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 get my little sunday porridge get my little social fellowship oh i love you oh i love you too and then you're stabbing each other in the back five minutes later. Oh, she's such a slut. Oh, did you see what she was wearing today? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Right, right? You're all backstabbing, lying. You, you feign your, your love and your comfort, and you have none sincerely to give. Come on. Don't you want to be more than that? More than just a liar lying through a stupid lie of an existence? Um... I mean, really, you're living in a, a, an ugly, stupid matrix that has nothing to do with, you know, being anything but a slave to nonsense. Just a, a slave to stupid routines and silly rituals and, oh, let's, let's bend our knees and pretty, pretty, and then we'll singy, singy, and what, this is going to solve a problem on earth. 
This will prevent a child from getting cancer. You're not even doing that. You're doing nothing. You're wasting your potential. You're wasting and you're insulting your intelligence. The notably, the most notable thing about us is this brain thing. And you might as well be using it like an anus. Because you're just squeezing shit. You're not really doing anything with your brain. It's just, you're just wasting it um, with a lie. Lies are toxic to neurology. Lies are toxic to logic. They do nothing but destroy it. They just, bad apple all over the place. One bad idea just wrecks the whole gear work. Just one gear out of place and the whole clock stops ticking and just make stupid noises. And that's all you're doing. You're making stupid noises, ignorant, babbly noises. You know, I think, I believe, I believe. Who cares? Because it's all drivel. It's nonsense. I mean, you know. <laughs> Get with re reality. Read a scientific book, maybe. Uh, there's been so many arguments. That's why I'm trying to make this argument in some sort of different, more personal way. It's because, yeah, people have argued all of the facts and figures. I mean, that's been done over and over and over again. And I, I would argue that it should be good enough. I mean, I didn't see, I just didn't need to be persuaded. <laughs> so, I'm at a, it's kind of a disadvantage. I didn't need to be deconverted. Because I was never converted. Um, I mean, I felt the pressure... But I also had an internal sense, say whatever you want to say, maybe just a love of my own penis, that I wasn't going to sit there and join a club that was anti-penis. It just didn't make any sense to me. I'm going to join the anti-penis club? <laughs> no, I ain't doing that. Um, so, you know, maybe it was that simple for me. Um, but the point is, I didn't join the club. I... I just never believed stepping on the crack was going to break my mother's back, so I just hopped on top of cracks all over the place. And I realized, hey, nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I can do this all day long. And then I finally figured out, no point in stepping on cracks, no point in paying any attention to them. So I'll just move on and try to be a human being instead. I'll try to figure out what's good and bad in the world. And you look around, you say, what's good and bad? Well, this suffering thing seems pretty bad. Yeah, let's have less of that. I've had some of that. Uh, it's really bad. You know, it's not just unpleasant. It's really bad. And, um, you know, less of that in the world. Cool. Hey, excellent. That's called being productive, right? You find something that's bad and you fix it. That's what a brain does. That's what intelligence does. See, that's the big joke, right? People think intelligence plays video games or something. No, that's silly desire. Okay, intelligence. If you just have raw intelligence, the only thing it ever does is say, where's a problem I can fix? Intelligence is like a program that just looks for something broken, something out of place, and puts it in its right place. It just, that's all it does. It just says, that, like, like if it's looking at a checkerboard, it can say, hey, that checker is going to get captured. Ah, fix that. It just fixes errors. It fixes mistakes. It fixes things that are wrong. That's what intelligence does. That's it's, 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 it's an entire it's, its entire descriptive function is to fix broken, to find broken and fix it. It doesn't have any other ambition. There's no other ambition to have. So that's the sort of the joke of our existence. So we don't exist because there's something that needs to get done. We exist and now something needs to get done, right? That's the joke of it. We're the problem. We bring brokenness to the game and now intelligence needs to fix it because it's broken but in a nothing universe where there isn't a bunch of suffering going on intelligence would just sit around and say I'm taking a nap because everything looks fine to me I can't find any broken I can't find any suffering to fix so I'm gonna go take a nappy because there's nothing for me to do here and that's the truth of it the broken is in your desire. The broken is in your need and your compulsions. And all of those are contrived by a DNA molecule just to make you lay eggs and die. And that's the insidious and horrible and awful truth. Um, but you can make the best of it. 
And making the best of it is activating your intelligence to look at the world and say, yes, I understand. Suffering be bad. Suffering needs to be mitigated. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be uh, slowed down. It needs to be suppressed. It needs to be compressed. It needs to be eliminated, if possible, because it's bad. And you can do that. And you can be productive. You can get in and out of your life and recognize, hey, I left the place better than it was when I got here. And that's the game of being intelligent. That's the game of being a human. And if you don't think that's godly, <laughs> if you don't think that's good enough for a god, oh, I came to Earth and I did my best to fix as many broken things as I saw. Um, if that's a bad ambition or a bad goal or a bad accomplishment by your god standards, then your god really isn't worth praying to. He's not worth praise. Um, if you left the place better than you got it, you left the house cleaner, you left the dishwasher more functional, <laughs> you know, you replaced the hoses and did the little repairs and did the maintenance, you did all the right things for all the right reasons. Oh, but you didn't say, praise the Lord. Oh, hey, catch 22. <laughs> yeah, go to hell forever. <laughs> yeah, I'll torture you forever. I mean, that's your God, right? That's your religion. I'll torture you forever for the silliest crimes could be committed. But you can go ahead and murder somebody, feign, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and it's all okay. Oh, come on, that's laughable. Sorry, I did kind of laugh a little because it's laughable. Right, anyway, time for a break. So I'll be back with more soon enough. Almost like now. All right, thought I'd finish up out here in the nature, you know, because that's the the more important truth, the more appropriate truth, is that's what we're all byproducts of, is this process of evolution. And so I suppose it's the most important counter-argument to religion is the fact that we do now have uh, an alternative explanation for existence. We don't need a fable anymore or a story or something that we make up. <clears throat> we can uh, see it in the mosquito that just landed on my finger, right? <laughs> right there. Here we can see the process uh, that we're part of right there. And, um, yeah, I guess this isn't a very good place for me to finish up. <laughs> yeah, so, and that's it, right? It's not, it's not hospitable. It's not a, a paradise that any kind of uh, one would think a god would make. This isn't a nice place to live. It's a rough, brutal, nasty place to live, this uh, biosphere. It's a place you have to struggle uh, against all kinds of blights and nastiness the little tiny microbes will get you uh, and especially back in the day when religion was invented that's all people had was <coughs> mysterious illnesses <coughs> and they blamed the the blights of the weather on the gods these were mistakes people could make in assuming that uh, something was playing with them that there was some reason, the desire to have a reason even, can be understood. But there's no excuse anymore. Um, we, we have the facts now. <laughs> we don't need to, to lie about what we are and what we're part of, uh, what made us. What made us was a, um, a chemical process and created a molecule and that molecule replicates and it makes organisms that are here <clears throat> one day, <laughs> uh, lay some eggs, and then aren't here anymore. Um, and they just keep doing that over and over again. Just as this model keeps changing and modifying through that process. But that's all it is. Um, it's just a game played over and over, uh, you know, by sentient creatures feeling things often um, 
and they're they're going to need they're going to want they're going to desire that the game be worth it that the pain and the suffering um, has a payoff and so they invented uh, a story that makes that possible it's not as bleak and harsh as uh, what things might appear to be the, the simpler truth that you're just here and that you just struggle uh, with your ambition and your need uh, to be satisfied and your vulnerability, your sensitivity and you, uh, you know, there's, there's no prize there's, there's no other <laughs> reward um, you know, more of the little little creatures little creatures, look at these little tiny frogs look at the tiniest of frogs, look at this big cat you're stepping on the frogs. Look at that little frog. Look at that. Tiny little frogs. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Tiny little frogs. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, nature's horrible and evil. I mean, 99.99% of them will be eliminated um, shortly. <laughs> you know, over the next few days. All these little frogs that are covering my ground here. And even this cat will be eliminated. Annihilated, and uh, even I will end up eliminated and annihilated, and there won't be any grand redeeming purpose to it. Um, I don't know why there's so many of these little fry. I don't know where they came from this year. Um, anyway, it is just kind of curious. You know, every year there's something different, um, out of place, weird, strange. Um, it's very wet this spring. Anyway, so um, the point of the story. Um, but the truth is important, and I guess that's all I, I want to say is, is that it's just as respect to your brain and its capacity. So here through this crude process, you've been bestowed with the ability to uh, think. Uh, to acquire information and knowledge and information, information has been done, um, and uh, you know it's a a kind of a shame, a humiliation uh, to use it poorly, to uh, not get the best out of it, uh, to come up with some way to deal with this reality we live in. Uh, the storm to the uh, you know the, you've just you've got this environment just think of a little thin atmosphere deep dark universe the physics of the world you exist in that's enough of a challenge to try to get your brain around um, no need for fables no need to cheat it don't cheat the truth it's a uh, yeah, I can't sell the truth as a, a good time because it's probably not going to be a good time. It's not going to be good for you personally, probably, because I think the truth creates a lot of obligation, um, a lot of guilt and sense of responsibility and sense of leaving things undone. There's so much waste and harm and suffering in the world. It's just unnecessary and silly. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in the sun <laughs> instead of doing something about it. So I'm guilty right there. Um, but that's enough of a mission statement to say I'm going to live my life and try to make the world a better place. Um, that's a better religion to be devoted to. Uh, as stated before, wouldn't that be a better commandment to live by? Leave the world a better place than you found it in, <laughs> than you got hatched into. Um, I think if you satisfy that, you've satisfied any good that can be done. Um, yeah, leave the sentient creatures better off for your existence. Be a benefit to uh, the stake, the state of the sentient condition. Um, you can't fail doing that. Um, 
any God who says you have failed or would have failed if you have done that would be a silly thing, <laughs> a silly made-up cartoon. Um, any God that would send you to hell if you have accomplished that successfully would be a silly thing to make up, to be devoted to. So just think of it that way. If you're afraid, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of disappointing a God too stupid to value your productivity, or at least your intention to be productive. If a God can't appreciate that, then it's not a God worth obedience or, or praise. Um, yeah, that should be enough right there. So there should be a lots of enoughs. <laughs> there should be a lot of things that people could say where you'd say, okay, yeah, I get it. I mean, even as a child, I mean, I didn't need all these arguments to, to make the insensibility of a god obvious. Um, but, you know, just the argument of where did you get this idea from? Um, why, are, why is your devotion so strong to this particular religion, the one you're clinging to? Um, did you fairly choose your religion? Did you evaluate all the 30,000 loony theories and pick the right one by some sort of intelligent analysis? Or is it just a byproduct of your culture, a byproduct of your family's uh, devotion? You're just living out some circumstantial reality uh, and not even choosing your own to live out. You should live your own life not uh, your family's tradition, not, uh, you know, the tradition of your kind, and uh, such. So, I think that about covers it. Probably running out of time. <laughs> and uh, so till the next time, uh, when we'll talk about uh, what it really means. <laughs> yeah, what it really means to take life seriously, to recognize the real values, the real value that exists in the world, to take real responsibility for the part you're playing, for your role in its maintenance and construction, um, for the deal being made with <laughs> the devil of your desire. Um, yeah, that should be interesting. And uh, such. So, let it go. <laughs> if you're a god bother, just let it go. It's, uh, it's not the truth, and it's not in the... You're not going to get the most out of yourself. Um, lost, you know, pretending. Um, living by fake notions of a good idea. Uh, mistakes. Yeah, religion's a mistake, and it'll just lead to other mistakes. Um, if you don't get free of it, if you don't shake yourself loose of it. It's just a tragic superstition, and it just doesn't deserve your attention and devotion. It's not a good, I mean, it's just a fable, and it's not even a good fable. Um, again, uh, would you create a world, the world that God has created? Would you make an AIDS virus? <laughs> you know, would you punish all women for eternity, for the sins of one? Would you call it a sin in the first place? Curiosity? Seduction? <laughs> These are things you would crucify, literally, people for? people with brains. Anyway, even the whole idea of being a slave to a theology, when it is so unintuitive to us, I think naturally, it's so obnoxious to us, to our own sense perception, um, to be a slave. Yeah, I glorify that. So anyway, that's enough. So, until next time.